예, 지금부터 첫 번째 We will now begin our first parallel session. This session is being hosted by the Institutes of Green Bioscience and Technology of Seoul National University. And we'd like to invite the director of the Institutes, Lee in Book, for his opening remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, early in the morning and you've traveled far for this session, so thank you. I am Director Lee Inbok of the Institute of Green Bioscience and Technology. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to this parallel session on food security on the Korean Peninsula and SDGs in North Korea. It's a great honor for me to be giving the opening address. Here in Pyeongchang, we are looking into peace on the Korean Peninsula and uh, our efforts for eventual unification. And as tasks for implementation for peace on the Korean Peninsula, we have to work hard in many different areas, including the economy and in establishing peace regime and in preparing for eventual unification. Food security is one of the most urgent priorities that we have. Particularly, there is chronic food shortage in North Korea and poverty issues. And so resolving them will ensure SDGs implementation and sustainable development of North Korea as well as uh, it is uh, reducing our unification costs. And so based on inter-Korean cooperation, we have to look into the current situation of the rural areas, the agriculture in North Korea, and also find ways for us to cooperate to help the North. And based on these efforts, we need to ensure that North Korea will implement and fulfill its SDGs and have sustainable development. So it is in under this environment that the Seoul National University's Institutes of Green Bioscience and Technology is playing its role. And we provide a lot of R&D and field-based activities in order to have future-oriented green bio-integrated R&D work. And we are in the process of establishing that foundation. And also, we create creative values for the state so that this region will become a Northeast Asian hub for food security and thus leading in uh, eventual peace and prosperity in this entire region. And we have also cooperation with the different government agencies, and we're trying to install and attract a lot of related businesses to this area. And we are also running a test bed for North Korea food security projects. And in particular, Dr. Ha Song-gi, who is one of our speakers, has a lot of research uh, results, which she will share with us today. And by having the uh, institute work in this area, we will be able to establish the foundation for not just North Korea's success in sustainable development, but also for the entire Korean Peninsula. And the Green Bioscience and Technology Institutes will continue its efforts to be more contributing more. And we ask you for your continued support and interest in the activities of our institutes. And also, the people that are participating in this session, they're very busy, and they have come from very far places. So we really appreciate that you are here with us today. So thank you so much once again. And we have uh, Director Kwon tae Jin and uh, uh, Dr. Ha Sung-gi, Ji sung tae and our panelists, Kim So-young, Kim Sung-nam. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you very much, Director, for your kind remarks. We will now begin the session. We have three speakers and two panelists. Our moderator for the session is Professor Im Jung Bin of Seoul National University. Uh, would you like to come up on the stage, please?
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As introduced, I am Im Jung Bin from Seoul National University. I would like to welcome you all to the Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2021. This is uh, the third forum. It's in its third year. And uh, we are the very first session of this forum, which makes this session all the more meaningful. Ever since the Winter Olympics, in order to continue on with peace and reconciliation, this peace forum was put together. And I would like to extend my gratitude to all of the organizers for making this happen. And despite COVID-19, we still have many participants here and also many joining us online. I uh, uh, would like to thank you and we would like to make this session as fruitful as possible. This session, as was mentioned uh, by our uh, director of the Institutes of Green Bioscience and Technology at the Pyeongchang campus of uh, uh, Seoul National University, uh, we have three speakers to talk about food security on the Korean Peninsula and SDGs in North Korea with two panelists. As mentioned, this is hosted by uh, the GBS team, and uh, I would like to introduce you to our speakers and panelists. Our very first speaker is the director of GSNJ Institute, Dr. Kwon Tae-jin. Uh, he also has been very much uh, into a study on North Korean economy in the past a big round of applause, please. He also was a part of the North Korean Economic Institute. Our second professor is the adjunct professor of SNU. Uh, she was uh, with the RDA in the past. Uh, and in terms of agricultural studies in the North, uh, Professor Ha sang -gi is uh, the true and living expert. A big round of applause, please. Our third speaker is Professor Ji sung Tae and uh, he is currently at the Pyeongchang campus. He is uh, a, a core expert on North Korean agriculture. A big round of applause, please. We are joined by two panelists, as mentioned, uh, particularly experts on North Korea as well as North Korean economy. We first have Kim so young senior reporter of the Farmer's Newspaper. She has uh, post uh, doctorate, postgraduate degrees on North Korea and she is an expert on the North Korean economy. A big round of applause. And we have from the NH Economic Research Institute, Dr. Kim Sung Nam at Seoul National University. He studied uh, the economies of uh, the Soviet Union economies. And there is uh, this uh, significant economic research institute at Nongyap or NH. Uh, and he's the Associate Research Fellow there, Dr. Kim Sung Nam. Thank you very much for joining us. Let us now move on to the presentations. Our very first speaker, as mentioned, would be Dr. Kwon Tae Jin. You have 20 minutes for your presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Kwon Tae Jin from the GSNJ Institute. So today at the Pyeongchang Peace Forum, I've been given an opportunity to give a presentation, so thank you very much. What I'll be talking about is inter-Korean cooperation, direction, and tasks for sustainable agricultural development in North Korea. Uh, I'd like to begin by explaining the current state of agriculture in the North as well as its SDGs. Next, I will talk about North Korea's task for sustainable development in this field. Last but not least, I will talk about the future direction task for inter-Korean cooperation in this field. On January 5th to the 12th of this year, North Korea's Workers' Party held, held its 8th Party Congress. And at its 8th Congress, new five-year strategy for economic development was presented. So from this year and for the next five years, they have a new plan adopted, which they will be pursuing. And prior to that, in 2016, during the Seventh Party Congress, there was a pr prior five-year strategy that was adopted. And uh, at that time, they also had adopted this five-year strategy. But uh, at this Eighth Congress, there was an assessment of the achievements of the past five years of efforts. And Kim Jong-un, according to Chairman Kim Jong-un's assessment, uh, 
the five-year strategy that was pursued until last year uh, overall was a failure. And the fact that North Korea is honestly acknowledging this failure is quite unusual. So anyhow, that is was the assessment that came out. And the reason for the failure would be that the external conditions were unfavorable. By external conditions, they mean UN and other international community sanctions against the North. And also internally, there was COVID-19, as well as other natural disasters that has led to the failure. According to our own assessments, uh, the fact that the internal and external conditions were poor, yes, it's true, but in fact, the fact that North Korea exerting its effort on its own to fulfill these strategies uh, would have a lot of limitations. And so the fact that the North Korean efforts have a lot of hindrances or limitations has not changed. This year's new five-year plan also, although we don't have the details, what they are emphasizing is that they want to have some kind of improvement and progress that could be felt by the North Korean people themselves. And so there are three basic principles that were mentioned. That is to uh, serve the people as they would heaven. So that is the basic principle. And secondly, there are the fact that they will uh, go for unity. And thirdly is self-rehabilitation. So they talk about the three, these three basic principles. And in fact, the situation has not improved much since the previous five years. So it'll be diff it may be quite difficult for them to attain these results. In 2019, North Korea announced its national grain procurement plan, and they are now pursuing a spin-off strategy. Previously, they focused more on the military, military um, ability and procurements. However, they are, it seems to be shifting their focus a little bit on the economic development. So the path that North Korea will have to take is actually going to be a long road because the internal external situation has not changed much. And this situation, under the situation, how is North Korea going to have sustainable development? So that is the main task that we face. And if there is something that North and South Koreas can cooperate together on, then that would be helpful for the entire Korean Peninsula. So I talked about what went on at the Eighth Party Congress, and there was an emphasis on changes that could be felt by the daily lives of the people and the fact that they need to seek a lot of solutions. On this aspect, Chairman or General Secretary Kim Jong-un had promised when he first became the leader of North Korea uh, that he would ensure that its people could feel changes. And so this promise by Chairman Kim seems to uh, go on right now. So it is saying that it will first resolve the food issue, food shortage problem. And in that process, the power of the state will be strengthened a little bit further. And they again, they talked about maintaining the 2019 green procurement goals. But last year, it had poor harvest. And according to what Kim Jong-un mentioned in 2019, he officially said there was historic progress. However, it did not really reflect the reality. And last year's or 2019 grain procurement goal will be maintained, which means that the state will continue to have more control over the food security issues. And there are five different elements. First is grain revolution, second, agricultural development, scientific development. Third is la agricultural land development. Fourth is improving productivity in low productivity areas. Fifth is field guidance strengthening. So those are the five important elements. And the fact, if you look at the fact that these five aspects were emphasized, we can assume that 
the strategy which seemed to tilt a little bit towards market in the past well is now going back to more controlling or state controlled system which can be worrisome in fact the UN has come up with its SDGs and North Korea has been quite proactive in trying to pursue and implement its SDGs so the sustainable development goals in the field of economy, society, and environment. Uh, North Korea is using them as guidelines in the different areas. And if there is possibility of in international collaboration, then North Korea is saying that it's willing to collaborate. However, if you look at the current situation in North Korea, it's very difficult, not just in industries, but the agriculture also is all stagnating. And in terms of external trade, it is plummeting. If you look at the figures of trade between North Korea and China last year, compared to the previous year, there was a fall of about two thirds. And last year, there was almost no trade and activity between the two countries. So under this situation, how is North Korea going to implement its new five-year development plan? So there are concerns and expectations that coexist. Let's now look at the chart comparing the situation of agriculture between the North, North Korea and South Korea. So uh, there was continued development, cultivation, or expansion of the cultivated land or agricultural land by North Korea. So North Korea has about 20% more land area. And however, if you look at the amount produced, there's not much difference between the two countries, which means that North Korea's agricultural productivity, technology level, capital input is much lower than that of the South. And so the short term task would be to increase the productivity for self sufficiency in agriculture. And this means that North Korea is suffering a lot in agriculture. And this is linked not just to the food issue, but the overall agricultural sector. Agriculture is very important in the North Korean economy, it takes up 20%. And employment in agriculture is a third of the total employment of the country. And so North Korea cannot just do away with its agricultural development. If you look at the food problem in the north right now, and the graph uh, shows you the North Korea's production amount, imports and aids, and the minimum requirement uh, between 1995 to recent years. After Kim Jong-un came into power, compared to the previous period, it has improved slightly. Yes, that's true. But then more recently, particularly since it, North Korea has been receiving sanctions against sanctions from the international community, there's been another drop in its food security. And so that's a task, urgent task that they face. In the early phase of the Kim Jong-un regime, there was some stability. However, recently, food shortage has aggravated. And this means that North Korea has not been able to secure enough agricultural capital and input. And it has been suffering from chronic poverty issue, which has not been resolved. If you look at the socioeconomic situation in the North, we could refer to the 2017 UNICEF mix or multiple indicator cluster survey of North Korea conducted for 8,000 households. And if you look at the results, well, in fact, in 2019, or it, uh, compared to the previous survey, there has been a slight improvement. However, the gap between the cities and the rural areas has widened. And so, Solving the polarization issue is another task that the North is facing at the moment. In October of 2019, 
in Russia's Vladivostok, the Northeast Asian Multi-Stakeholder Forum, the third forum was held, and North Korea attended all three forums. And if you look at what the North Korean representative said, uh, well, there are 17 UN SDGs and 169 targets and 232 indicators. In the case of North Korea, it did not adopt all of the goals, targets, and indicators, but overall it has 17 goals, 95 targets, and 130 indicators. That was the announcement made by North Korea at that time. So this is the latest figures we have, which will help our understanding of the SDG implementation in the North at the moment. And so this is linked not just to its economy, but its society and environment. Uh, and North Korea is making sure or saying it clearly that all three dimensions will be considered. If you look at the uh, dashboards and trends on North Korea's SDGs, well, the SDG goal number two or ending poverty, that will be very important. So the current situation in the North is very poor, but the situation is improving according to its own assessment. And in the future, to reach the, uh, this SDG goal, there's still a long road ahead. North Korea's SDGs and economic development and that linkage between the two, that was already being reflected back in 2016 during the Seventh Party Congress when the five-year strategy was adopted at that time. And in fact, this connection or linkage will continue on under the new five-year plan for economic development. In particular, SDGs 2, 6, 7, 11, 13, and 15 are being emphasized by the North. And these usually have to do with the lives, daily lives of the public. And so through SDGs, North Korea hopes to communicate with the international community to induce support from the global community. However, there are many hindrances uh, against sustainable development, and I have listed six here. First is because of its closed economy, it has difficulty in securing or mobilizing capital and technology. So that will be the first stumbling block. Secondly, there is a distortion in resource distribution among the different industries, which leads to low efficiency. And so North Korea needs to work on improving its resource distribution. Next is very outdated SOCs and poor investments in human capital. And so capacity building is a must in the future. And the legal and institutional frameworks are inadequate. And so there needs to be continuous improvement here as well. And the transaction costs within the North is very high. So North Korean locally made products have low quality. For future development, they will need to engage more in external trade, but this is a stumbling block right now. And lastly, there is poor training uh, provided to human capital and low liquidity. And so through overall industrial development, North Korea has to ensure that there is higher mobility in its human capital among the different industries in the future. I will now talk, talk about tasks for sustainable development in the North. After Kim Jong-un came into power, there has been kind of pursuit of reforms and opening so far, but they ha are insufficient. So they need to focus more on the market to speed up the process of opening and reform. Those would be important tasks. And to prove, uh, introduce an in incentive system, North Korea is expanding its responsible management system or socialist corporate responsibility management systems. And so it's still in its 
um, early stages, they need, this system has to be expanded. And in introducing external capital technology and management methods, it needs to open up more. And traditionally, North Korea pursued planned economy systems, but now it needs to harmonize planned economy and market, and that would be another important task. Task, excuse me. And so, for sustainable development of North Korea, in what areas could the two Koreas cooperate? So now, let me talk about the basic direction and tasks. In talking about the agricultural situation or food situation in North Korea, we usually uh, focused on the amount of calorie that should be absorbed in a day. However, we should not we should shift our perspective to focus not just on food but on food items. So you know, fruits, vegetables, and you know, diff the different food items that have to be consumed within North Korea. So we need a perspective shift. Secondly, we always emphasized provision or supply with regards to agriculture previously. However, North Korea's rationing system has collapsed. And so the people who really need the food, food assistance, how are they going to have enough accessibility? So to ensure its accessibility, the income of the residents, the North Korean people, should be increased so that they can purchase the goods that they need themselves. And rather than planned economic systems, North Korea or the, we need to cooperate more to emphasize the role of the market. And there is indeed a need for that effort. And for to ensure that North Korea's economy will be able to have self-reliant and sustainable development, we need to ensure that North Korea and the international community also collaborates. And so South Korea could contribute to enhancing this international collaboration. Lastly, I'd like to talk about inter-Korean agricultural cooperation tasks. So we could identify cooperation projects through which both Koreas could receive benefits. For example, in North Korea, it has very low fertility in its farmlands. But in South Korea, we have excessive amounts of livestock byproducts. And so these livestock byproducts that South Korea has, we can utilize that in order to improve the fertility rate of the farmlands in the north. And secondly, we could collaborate in exchanges with regards to genetic resources and in securing species diversity on the Korean Peninsula. And the institutions for sustainable development in North Korea, they are insufficient. They are not operating properly right now. And so we have to collaborate with the North for assessments and res uh, solution development. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Dr. Guan. Dr. Guan has just mentioned the tasks that North Korea and South Korea face for sustainable agricultural development in North Korea. In the interest of time, I will not be summarizing his presentation. There's a question uh, that we've received online, and uh, later on during our discussion session, we will try to address those questions for Dr. Kwon. And the speakers, you are free to give your presentation either sitting down or at the podium. The second speaker is Dr. Ha Sung-gi, so please welcome her with a big hand. Hello, everyone. As introduced, I am Ha Sung-gi. Many people think I am a man, uh, but uh, many people are surprised because a beautiful woman stands. So once again, thank you for that welcome. Today, I would like to uh, talk about how we can in generate income for the North to solve their food security issues. To create income, we need to increase productivity of their farms. and. 
we, what I mean by we are the North Korean scientists, or the South Korean scientists, excuse me. So we want to talk about how we can enhance productivity. And today I will elaborate on the studies on that. Uh, many do say, uh, or there's a misunderstanding uh, that North Korea lacks arable land. This is the Korean Peninsula, and 70 to 80 percent of the peninsula are mountains. However, there are also plains, and you can see that in the case of the plain area, North Korea has a larger share than South. Uh, and what about arable land? As you've seen in Dr. Kwan's presentation, North Korea has a larger piece of land of arable land. And the North is utilizing their total arable land. However, the South is cultivating only half of its arable land. And the population of the South is two times that of the North. So considering that, we cannot only say that the North Korean environment is just dire. And what about uh, the climate? It's true that uh, they are at lower temperatures and the precipitation is also less. And this can be an inconvenience in farming. And the current uh, biggest challenge, uh, well, what I've mentioned right now is all the more, uh, more or less the same, but their post-harvest loss is only 20 to 30 percent. For the grains, it's 25 to 30 percent. And in the case of uh, the soybeans and other barley and wheat, it's close to 30 to 35 percent. In other words, even with good harvest, about a third has to be done away with or are done away with in the process of harvest. Most of the post-harvest losses occur at the part or during harvest. In Korea, there are many harvester machines where threshing is to, takes place uh, on the site and packaged on the spot. And it's true that in the 70s and 80s, South Korea had to go through a similar situation where everything has to, had to be done manually. So when they do that and when they stand this uh, on the pillars, uh, the birds during the day and the rats at night have a feast and in the rain uh, everything gets moldy. And based on our calculation, we found out that North Korean productivity is only 55% of that of the South, and in the case of livestock, only 10 to 15 percent that of the South. So what we decided to do was research on the causes behind this low crop productivity, and there were a number of factors, the first being infrastructure. They don't have fertilizers, chemicals, machinery. There is basically nothing in the North, and we've seen some severe degradation of the forest. Uh, water is also an issue. They don't have the right irrigation facilities, and I think we can help them out on that one. Second is on the environmental factors. It's not that poor. So considering the circumstances, I think that there are certain technological developments that can be possible. So third on technology, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's on the financial resources. But I think that there could be some assistance offered by the South and the institutional factors. Policy issues is not something that we can do. So we will just have to mention this and move on. So in in order to enhance crop productivity, what can the South Korean researchers do? We can select optimum cultivar for the North. This is a good way to do that. And second is to develop the right crop management technology for North Korea. Another would be managing soil fertility and help them prevent pests. We can review the current status and provide them ways to prevent pests. And all researchers, of course, do not have access to the North. So does that mean we have to suspend our research? Of course, that's not the case. What we did was review all of the experiment uh, stations across the South. We looked into the climate and the weather conditions. And uh, the RDA, in order to select the right cultivars, have put in place many stations. Chuncheon, Cheon, Jinbuk, and Pyeongchang are quite similar to the northern climate. And if we cover the Pyeongchang area, I think that's excluding the highlands of the north. About 80% of the North Korean territory actually can be covered with these experiment stations in the south. And in the case of the areas where it cannot be covered, uh, cooperation and collaboration with, with the Yang, Yanbyeon Agricultural University is on another way to look into Tandong um, and in, to look into the Tandong and Yanbyeon area area next to Shiniju as well as Hunchun near Tuman River to cover the entire agro land of DPRK. So the first thing that we did
was uh, to select uh, optimal cultivars for DPRK. So first we study the food crops uh, that were optimal for North, which would include uh, potato, rice, soybeans, corn, barley, and wheat. But there was a lot of collaboration done in the potato front, so we decided to exclude that from this research because there are also some good findings already identified. But let me just brief you on the collaboration on potatoes. There aren't that many that do harvest potatoes right now, but I want to say that corn, and rice and potatoes are something that we have to look into. But what's interesting is that there is no overlap in harvest season between potatoes, corn, or rice. Uh, what they do is it's uh, quite interesting because double cropping with wheat or corn is possible because potato seeds are sown late March and harvest takes place in June. So the period of famine comes between spring and summer and potatoes are great hardy plants that can solve food shortage issues during this period. That is why Chairman Kim Jong-un's choice of potato was wise and he said that potato is the new rice. He established a potato, a potato division as well as an institute on potatoes because he knew the importance of potatoes to solve the famine issues. Not only that, there were international cooperation products, projects for potatoes. Uh, the NGO World Vision was on the field in collaboration with potato experts of the Rural Development Administration or RDA to engage in a collaboration of 15 years. There was, uh, it's, it's important to understand uh, the resistance to viruses uh, and bacteria of potatoes. So what happened was based on this research, uh, these potato tissue culture systems were put together along with the five seed potato production facilities built across DPRK. These are some of the pictures I took at the seed potato production facilities in the north. I visited uh, the facilities in 2015 in person and you can see how it was bred. All in all, potato production volume is something that we also should look into, and now it exceeds that of the South. So this indicates that the International Potato Cooperation has enhanced potato production uh, in DPRK. Uh, but for potatoes, post-harvest uh, losses are great because they're harvested in the summer season, but the North does not have the right storage facilities and they don't have the right transport mode. So it's very difficult to transport them to other locations. In the case of Chun Samjin, for instance, uh, they try to find a way to grind uh, the potato into power, powder to store. So what we wanted to do was, of course, uh, do something about the situation. And as I've already mentioned, our research was all the more focused on rice, soybean, corn, barley, and wheat because there was already a lot of collaboration on potatoes. In terms of cultivars and lines, there are more than 2,000 lines of crops, especially rice. And researchers do analyze that. And what happens is... And what happened was when we compared that uh, of the North and South, the productivity of North cultivars was a bit poor. But and we found out that the rice cultivar slightly lacked productivity, but that wasn't all that bad where, compared to that of the South. And another finding was that rice cultivars that grew well with minimized fertilizer application was a target up till now in the North. So most of North Korean rice cultivars were susceptible to lodging with just a slight increase in fertilizer application. So many people would think that just an addition or supply of fertilizers will solve the problem, but that's not the case, of course, as you can see here. Uh, these were some of the cultivars that were cult uh, developed in, uh, in the south. More than 81 to 200 cultivars were developed, and we looked into how it can be applied to the south, or, or to the north, north, excuse me. There's the Jinbu, Cheonwon, and Suwon, Dandong, Yeonbyeon, and Hunchun, uh, where we analyzed the results. And according to this three-year experiment, high productivity was staged uh, for Sangmi and Suwon all of this information can be shared, so if you have any willingness to collaborate uh, for agriculture, please let us know. We will share this information. This is on barley and wheat. Barley and wheat is cultivated not in summer but in winter. 
and uh, here you can see that if it is too cold, seeds cannot be sown in the winter, and thus there are two cultivation methods of spring sowing and the fall sowing method. Here, depending on the location, it may be different. So according to our experiment in Yeonchun and Yongjong, the Chongwuchar Buri was good for spring sowing for both locations, and fall sowing was only possible in Yeonchun and not in Yongjong. As for soybeans, for Chang, Yeonpung was good for Yeonchun and Chuncheon, but Sunnok and Tajing was desirable at Yongjong and Tandung. In uh, the north, uh, these are the Xinhuang Oge Huang Da Wu corn cultivars. They're all uh, South Korean cultivars and they grew very well. And uh, what we did was bring together all of the uh, information that we researched and we and we selected the best two to three cultivars that recorded the highest productivities. Second is on the cultivation technology. We have access to 27 meteorological observation sites of the north, so we were able to analyze all of this data from these stations. We gathered this uh, together and analyzed 36 years worth of data. And according to our analysis, uh, what we did was look into regions uh, suitable for rice cropping out of these 27 areas. So when we do uh, crop such rice, which areas would be safe? Uh, there are certain areas like Najin, for instance, where they are unsafe because bad climate conditions may have a negative impact. So we indicated that and we color coded the areas. Not only that, we reviewed all of the uh, characterizations of rice cultivar in the north, and it was the same case for soybeans. We identified and characterized 44 North Korean soybeans. Now, this is from Yi Song Wu of Chungnam University. And you can see here North, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, China, and the U.S. cultivars uh, were researched. We looked into the genetic conditions as well as the relations. And as a in the case of the North, there was an active introduction breeding uh, from China to North Korea and for the South most of them were introduced from Japan and this can be a critical information in the case of barley and wheat, uh, the Daegualyeong and Dongducheon are some areas that are similar to the highlands of the north. And this, uh, these areas give us information as to when sowing is most optimal. And Yicheon can cover the Hwangyeo-do area. So this uh, gives information on whether fall sowing or spring sowing is optimal. Not only that, in order to increase increase income, we need a cropping system. This is a crop calendar. So for instance, in the case of Yeoncheon and Pyeongchang, corn and corn and corn and perilla uh, would be the best uh, combination or corn buckwheat. So all of this information is on when the sowing and harvest should take place and what kind of cropping system would be most optimal. In the case of Yeoncheon, it can cover Hwanghae-do and Pyeongchang system can be applied to uh, Pyeongan, Namdo and Bukdo. We have this information and data, and we also offer information on, on which areas of the north can, whether this can be applied. Next is on soil fertility. The greatest challenge here is soil erosion. So cover crops are critical here, so we need to study which cover crops can prevent soil erosion. Not only that, chemical fertilizers and organic fertilizers, how well they help recover soil fertility was also something that we researched. And according to our research, alpha Far Far was the best in terms of cover crops. Alpha Fars has the best production of free manure and with the best microbial activity. So as uh, a fertilizer, it was an excellent source and also it was best in reducing soil erosion. For a swift increase in soil fertility, we found out that a combination of chemical and organic fertilizers as well as gypsum was the best. This was known to be the optimal combination to recover soil fertility as quickly as possible. Next is on pest management. Pest management is where pesticides come in, but of course pesticides cannot enter into the north. We cannot go into the north and collect the pests or insects, so what we had to do was infer from the insects that were collected from the south uh, to understand how the crops will respond. For rice, uh, in the case of the BLB, which is the most critical pathogen, 
We found out that all of the all four cultivars of the north were impacted by BLB. So in other words, they were susceptible to this bacterial leaf blight. Next is on the rice blast pathogen. Kirchu one cultivar was strong towards rice blast pathogens. However, the others were all vulnerable. Any rice blast pathogens of the south uh, has uh, actually uh, impacted all of the cultivars of the north. And we looked into the genetic backgrounds of the rice blast pathogen. We cannot go to the north, so uh, we went to Pengyongdo, which is quite uh, close to the north. And the pathogens here that were uh, isolated was probably something that came from Pangyeongdo and from Pengyongdo and Gosang. The genetic patterns were quite similar to the rice blast pathogens that were isolated in the south. There was a 70-year separation between the north and south, and there was a slight difference in the genetic background due to that. And there were also some pathogens that were identified in Pengyongdo, which could not be seen in the south, and we're currently engaging in an in-depth research on that. Next is on the insects. In the case of the insects in both the north and the south inlands, were all more or less similar. Uh, for the rice, we saw rice water weevils. This is a major issue for rice, and for soybeans, uh, alphids are are a major issue. And for corn, the corn borers. In the south, we do see many flying pests coming in from the Southeast Asian region. So because we couldn't go to uh, the north, we went to Tandung and we monitored all of these insects. And we found out that most of, from Tandung were uh, migratory pests, the flying um, pests coming from the air currents from Southeast Asia. And we thought that, of course, in the north, we would be seeing some similar pests there. Recently, in the south, there are not that many um, native pests that stay here throughout the winter season, mostly through the airflow or the air currents coming in from the Southeast Asian region. Uh, we have in Guangdong of China an station, and we're collecting uh, pests and insects here. And we sent a signal to our farmers, uh, indicating that uh, these insects are coming in and that they should prepare in advance. And I think that this is information that we can share with the North. All in all, uh, if I may summarize uh, the research, what we did was select two to three optimal cultivars uh, for the individual regions. And in order to better the understanding on these cultivars, we put together these reports or manuals on the selected cultivars. There are many cultivar-related information in these manu manuals, and this is all open for everyone to see. And all of the data on crop management and cultivation was put together into manuals. It's the same case for pest management. This is critical. So we selected uh, the critical pests, and uh, we provided information on the ways to deal with the situation, and this was put it together into manuals. So for anyone that wants to engage in inter-Korean cooperation, there are uh, certain fertilizers and cultivars that could be very useful when you go into the north, which will help enhance the efficiency of the cooperation. It would be great if we can engage in technology transfer, share materials, and provide materials on site, but right now this is not possible. That's why we need untacked modes and methods of operation. All of this information is already published, so the scientists of the North can ask for this information if they want. And all of this data uh, is being published and presented at symposiums actively. So I would like to ask you uh, to understand uh, that these sources are out there, available, and I hope you use all of these resources. And this is not done by myself. All of these individuals are part of this program, and they enabled and provided me uh, the grace to present this to you all. I truly hope that uh, we can enhance agricultural production based on inter-Korean cooperation. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, Dr. Ho, thank you very much for your presentation. As you've heard from her presentation, uh, we say that uh, we should not provide fish to those in famine, but rather to have them and teach them how to catch fish. In the same vein, in Gangwon-do and the northern parts of Gyeonggi and Tandung and Yambyeon, these are areas uh, that have some similar climate conditions with the north. And if we can offer them with sowing, breeding, and pest management techniques and technologies, uh, uh, that would be very useful. And I heard this presentation at a different conference, and I was very surprised. I know that there's a lot of collaboration in uh, forestry, and I wasn't aware of this collaboration in the agricultural area, but 
Uh, based on her presentation I heard last time, I was very much impressed and surprised. So as was mentioned, when we do engage in inter-Korean collaboration, these research studies can uh, be of great use. Once again, thank you very much for your presentation. As for the questions, we will collect them all and address them later. The next speaker is Dr. Chi Song Tae. It's nice to meet all of you today. I am Professor Chi Song Tae at Seoul, from Seoul National University. Our graduate school is in the Pyeongchang campus. And earlier, you heard from our director, Director Lee in Bok, about the activities of the Institutes of Green Bioscience and Technology. And since we are working in Pyeongchang, we were looking into how or where we can, in which area we can collaborate with North Korea. And agroforestry came to the fore. And so we tried to also uh, do some work with relations to SDGs implementation as well. So that will be the gist of my presentation. As the earlier speakers have mentioned, I would like to also begin with a brief explanation of the food security in North Korea and the contributions of agroforestry in the field of agriculture. Thirdly, the, I will be talking about the current state of agroforestry in North Korea, the results of the efforts so far. Last but not least, uh, Seoul National University Pyeongchang campus and the Pyeongchang County. What kinds of comparative advantage do we have in the field of agroforestry and how we can collaborate with North Korea? If you look at the food security situation in North Korea, particularly the supply side, you, we have some estimates presented here, and the RDA also continues to track grain production in the north. And so there seems to be a shortage, grain shortage of about 86,000, 86 to 120 tons per year. So previously, there was a lot of aid that went into Nor North Korea to make up for this shortage. But because of the economic sanctions, as well as COVID-19, it's difficult for outside aid to go into the North. So North Korea has to try to has to try to secure that shortage on its own. But it is faced with a lot of input shortage in the first. Uh, phase and because of climate change and other environmental risks, its situation is very difficult. And so we need a new production model to help with North Korea. And so agroforestry can be considered as one of such new models. FAO has presented specific numbers with regards to North Korea's food security. About 10 million people in the North are experiencing food insecurity, and particularly children aged 6 to 23 months. A third of these children do not receive the minimum acceptable diet. And you will see in this slide that, of course, the situation in North Korea is very difficult. However, there has been an overall trend of diversification of food item consumptions within North Korea. And so there are some efforts that the government has been um, putting in place, such as the restoration of the farm household management. It has been running the Onchon Orchard and cooperative farm reforms and the Sepo complex clusters as well. And there has been smoother trading that has gone on in the Changmadangs, the markets. And so, in line with the diversification of food item consumption in North Korea, all of these could be put together to be the new model that will increase production. And uh, agroforestry, as the name implies, is putting together agriculture and forestry industries 
in order to maximize the agricultural, the social, economic, and environmental benefits for land users at all levels. And of course, there are different types of agroforestries. So what kinds of industries are put together? For example, if it's food, or crops combined with trees, then you would call it agri silvicultural systems. Or you could also have pastures or livestock put together with the forests, and that will be silvopastoral systems. And uh, there is also an, a form of agroforestry in which the sloping lands are used. And uh, it, there's a technology called sloping agricultural land technology or SALT that is adopted he, here. From 1970s, North Korea had reclaimed the mountainous areas to secure more to more arable lands. However, they had experienced soil erosion and deforestation problems. And so to improve these problems, Agroforestry can be another consideration as a solution. Next, I'd like to talk about agroforestry's contribution to SDG's implementation. Among the 17 SDG goals, and you see the list here, but and there are slight differences, but agroforestry can contribute to attaining nine different uh, SDG goals. So it's a very effective model for SDGs as well. On the right side, you will see the forest land areas in the PRK. And you will see that there's been a lot of forest decline that has happened over the years. There's been a lot of soil erosion problems. Uh, due to increased precipitation, and there's also a problem of low productivity in the arable lands in North Korea. And if you look at the photos, you will see that there are a lot of barren mountains. Most of the forests have been destroyed. There were about 7 million hectares in 1990, but by 2020, the forest area was reduced to 6 million hectares. On the agroforestry model, North Korea has begun to take interest, and from year 2000, in fact, North Korea has been interested in agroforestry, and in 2004, the Switzerland Development Office, the SDC office in Pyongyang began discussions on introducing agroforestry, and in 2008, the World Agroforestry Center provided advice and recommendations to the North, and in 2013, based on the previous experiences, a guideline was developed and distributed throughout North Korea. So if you look at this agroforestry guide in North Korea, so for example, mushrooms or beekeeping or other non-timber uh, activities, there are specific guidelines on these activities as well. And in 2014, there was a booklet that was a uh, developed based on the past 10 years of sloping land management activities that went on in North Korea. And in this report, you will see that uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un has mentioned many things about this sloping land management, and one of which is to try to a statement encouraging North Korea to accept a lot of practices from outside countries. And there was an action plan that was developed eventually. The DPRK National Agroforestry Strategy and Action Plan was developed and announced in 2015. One leading agency that collaborated with North Korea was FAO. 
and there was a three-year support project that FAO uh, participated in, and $400,000 was invested. And if you look at the results of this collaboration, you will see the specific numbers here. And the vegetable productivity went up by about 11%. And one interesting project is, have you ever heard of the tree vitamin tree? So there's a lot of vitamins in the fruit that this tree produces. So from 2017 until 2019, FAO invested about $300,000 for this sea buckthorn or vitamin tree project cult, um, providing cultivation and processing assistance in the Samjeon County in North Korea. And the plan was to have an output of um, 10 thousand tons in total and through agroforestry there are a lot of goals that we can realize food security nutrition security energy security and many other different goals can be attained and these accomplishments, and if we were to match that with the SDGs, you will see that there's actually a good match between the two. Not just on uh, poverty, but also gender, biodiversity, bioenergy goals of the SDGs also. Next is the kinds of cooperation or how uh, North and South Korea should cooperate in agroforestry. South Korea has its comparative advantage in agroforestry. As you know, in the 1970s, South Korea carried out a successful forest screening activities, and there was a national reforestation campaign carried out at that time. The local government, the central government, the forestry cooperatives and related agencies established a very effe um, effective governance system. And the biggest reason cause of deforestation was the need for timber. And so there was a lot of a fuel or alternative energy industry related projects that was that was developed and also these activities contributed to increasing nutrition security and also eventually to enhancing the overall quality of life for the south korean people as for possible areas of cooperation they could include for example technology sharing or transfer Next is the development of a crop and cropping system that will be suitable for agroforestry together. And also the insect and pest problem, which we will encounter in agroforestry. We could develop countermeasures together. Next in Pyeongchang, which is called the capital forestry of uh, South Korea, it has a lot of strengths and it has a lot of infrastructure and capital needed for agroforestry, an abundant resource. For example, we have the Highland Agricultural Research Center, Korean Beef Research Center, Poultry Research Center, and RDA, under RDA, all here in Gangwon Province. And we have the Eastern Regional Forest Service as well as the training center of the Korea Forestry Promotion Institute near here. And we also have the Mountain Herbs Herb Research Center. And Pyeongchang County has been designated as a special zone for uh, many livestock species. And so we could collaborate through these agencies 
in high value added food item or agricultural produce selection and cooperation. Now I'd like to talk about the comparative advantage that our SNU Pyeongchang campus has. We have a huge area and we have highlands sloping land within our campus as well. And you will see that you, there's a lot of major areas, research areas that we are engaging in. Food, Green Echo, International Collaboration, and also in forestry policies, as well as the basic um, cultivars and breeding research as well. So out the resources that we have, as well as the resources that exist surrounding us, we could utilize those to establish a center for collaboration in agroforestry with North Korea. So that's going to be not just limited to agroforestry eventually, but we will try to expand the scope to include other areas of agriculture in order to collabor expand our collaboration with North Korea. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Dr. G. A warm applause for him, please. Professor Chi Song Tae focused on agroforestry and uh, its linkage to the nine SDG goals. And in fact, the I attended an FAO meeting in China a few years ago, and the high-ranking officials in China was talking a lot about agroforestry also, and also agroforestry will be very important for North Korea. So this is one area of strategic importance, but this requires a lot of assistance from South Korea. And uh, Dr. G also talked about the comparative advantage of the Pyeongchang campus of SNU, which can be utilized for furthering cooperation with the North. Thank you very much for your presentations. Well, we heard from our three speakers, and as I have already introduced, we have two discussants. First, uh, we have Kim So Young, senior reporter of the Farmers Newspaper, uh, to give our comments for about five minutes, and Dr. Kim Sung Nam will follow. So, first, Ms. Kim So Young. Thank you very much for the presentations. And uh, the areas covered may seem different, but there are also some common denominators. Uh, so it was great food for thought. And rather than posing a comment or question, I would like to share with you some of the insights that I was able to drive from the presentations. Recently, if you look at the North, many people talk about marketization, that markets are springing up. Uh, with the Kim Jong-un um, taking power, there was, uh, there was also always a fork in the ro road. And many do say that we're seeing a more focus on markets increasing the income of the North Korean residents. So not only crops, but processed foods and high-end fruit and vegetables are witnessing a growth in demand, is what they do say. And if we take that perspective, uh, when I was studying in graduate school, I heard from North Korean defectors. And those that were here recently, would not talk about famine, but rather they say that they had enough meat, they selected a variety of vegetables that they uh, wanted, and also grains of high quality. And Dr. Kwon Tae-jin has also mentioned some key points. When we talk about food security in the North, we uh, focus on rice, corn, potatoes, or crops. And of course, uh, these are important, but we need to expand the scope. We need to look at uh, the overall food stuff that may be available. And I think that this was uh, a key comment that we need to take into account that reflects reality. If you look at income, we're seeing a polarization of income in the North. What's happening is there's a lot of such food stuff out in the market, but there are those that do not have the financials to buy this food. So accessibility towards food to enhance food security is something that we need to look into. In the past, it was more so focused on a supply approach. But now we have to look at the entire market and demand. Can the residents, do they have, can they buy the food? Do they have accessibility to the market? 
this was something that I was interested in in the past, and I had to, of course, agree to what Dr. Kwan said in his uh, presentation. And Professor Hall also mentioned a key point. Uh, she talked about the crops of corn, barley, wheat, and rice, uh, of selecting the two optimal cultivars for the North. And you share with us your research results. But when we speak with defectors, and if we look into the literature that comes from unofficial sources, it's not only about crops, but vegetables and fruit. So there's a high demand for high value added vegetables and fruit. In other words, North Koreans want to cultivate uh, quality vegetables and fruit because, because these have markets, they want to sell these vegetables and fruit that can have them earn a lot of money. What they do is they get information from China, for instance, to grow these high quality vegetables and fruits. So uh, for Dr. Ha, if you can expand your research scope into vegetables as well as fruit to find cultivars uh, that can uh, help them increase their income, I think that that would be very well received by the North Korean colleagues. And you also mentioned about the post-harvest losses. Uh, we have a processed food market that's growing, and I think it's in line with this, where when we do engage in inter-Korean co cooperation, we talk about how many machineries and fertilizers should be supplied to the North. However, if we look at North Korea, storage, processing uh, is an area where we're seeing high demand. In Korea, APC is something that's used where storage and processing can be done uh, all on the same spot. And what about corn? There can be many ways uh, to process this corn by using different and diversified machineries. And if we offer those modes to the north, uh, I think that in uh, collaboration, we'd be seeing a positive feedback from the north. And also on manure and livestock, this was mentioned by um, Dr. Kwan, oh, where in Korea, we've uh, there's this major switch towards carbon neutrality of 2050. And the issue is about livestock manure in the south. But then again, for the north, they don't have chemical fertilizers or organic fertilizers. And when we do supply fertilizers, I think that there can be a match. For us, we can find a way to achieve carbon neutrality. And for the north, they can find a way to enhance their productivity by utilizing these manure and fertilizers. And last but not least, this was something quite surprising for me, where in Pengyongdo, uh, there was this rice blast pathogen that was identified in Pengyongdo, which was not found in the inlands of the south. And uh, you've mentioned that this may be from Pangyeto. And my first impression was in the end of uh, 2019, the ASF, the swine flu, the African swine flu was identified in Korea. And there was a lot of say on where this came from. Uh, but at the end of the day, there, it wasn't a yes or no answer. But it's true that the viruses were identified in the border regions. And they, some did say that it came from the north. So the whores and the wild pigs are now controlled in terms of their movement. But the fact that this rice blast pathogen, if this really is from Hangedo, I think that the North and South can take this opportunity to engage in cooperation. This could be a, a, an important link. Livestock uh, pathogens are, of course, important, but plant pathogens are as important. Therefore, I think that with regard to pests and pathogens, especially like the rice blast pathogen, I think we can find a way uh, to promote cooperation between the two Koreas. Yes, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, as you've heard from our comments, uh, for her comments, she is an expert uh, on this field. So you, you've been able to focus on all the key points of the three presentations. Thank you very much. Let us move on to our next discussant, Dr. Kim Sung Nam, please. Hello, I am Kim Sung Nam from the NH Economic Research Institute. I also appreciate the three earlier presentations. And so I'd like to talk about two things that came up to my mind as I was listening to the presentations. On the first presentation by Dr. Kwon Tae-jin, so he mentioned the results of the recently held 8th Korea Workers' Party Congress. 
And you also mentioned that rather than market-based, planned economy is the new direction that North Korea will be taking. At the 8th Party Congress, of course, we did receive some hints of this new direction. So there was a lot of marketization that was allowed in the past, particularly in commercial activities. Uh, however, now localization is being emphasized or domestication. But I'd like to take note of uh, this in particular, in that the mention that North Korea said that it's going to try to utilize the financial and the price space more. What this means is that our style of responsible management system, our style of market-based uh, principles or market-based uh, methods will be utilized. The fact that it mentioned that its economic space will be utilized means that North Korea has not given up on the market completely. Right now, because of the economic sanctions and COVID-19, there are a lot of difficulties. So it is emphasizing um, the domestication more. However, it will continue to incre try to increase efficiency by utilizing a market at the same time also. And if there is a breakthrough in the US-North Korea negotiations, then eventually North Korea will try to introduce uh, good elements of or favorable elements of the market uh, economy into its own country. So I believe that that possibility exists. Secondly, with regards to development cooperation with North Korea, from 2005, rather than humanitarian aid, North Korea has been asking for development projects, and it has emphasized this since then. And we heard earlier the metaphor that we should be teaching how to fish rather than giving fish to the people in need. And we can interpret this as as following. North Korea previously was resistant to monitoring the humanitarian aid activities. So North Korea uh, was resisting receiving the aid because they did not want to receive monitoring. However, this is a legal uh, prerequisite with regards to receiving international aid. And so this is unavoidable. So if we were, in fact, when we provided rice to North Korea, North Korea was very adamant about uh, refusing monitoring. And so North Korea was saying that we, they were receiving the loan, the rice as a form of loan, so they did not want monitoring. So under the current circumstance, how can we resolve this uh, dilemma? North Korea is still resisting any internal uh, investigation by the outside uh, people with regards to the receiving outside help. So how are we going to make a breakthrough on this issue? I believe that as Dr. mentioned, Dr. Pon mentioned earlier, having a mutually win-win project pursued together would be one solution that we could consider. In other words, to ensure that both North Korea and South Korea will gain something from collaboration. I think that will be enough to persuade North Korea. Professor Cho jae oh recently conducted a survey on sustainable development in North Korea, and he looked at the sustainable or successful projects between the two Koreas, and there were three uh, uh, projects that stood out. First, in Gyeonggi province, there was a four-year malaria uh, pandemic defense or epidemic defense um, project. And so the local residents of both North Korea and South Korea were able to benefit from lower contraction of malaria through the project. Another project is, was in Jeju Island. For about 10 years, there was a support of the um, tangerines uh, uh, provided to North, assistance North provide North Korea. And that allowed price stability in South Korea as well because we could manage uh, the supply level. And so this was well received by the South Korean farmers as well. And when we provided rice to North Korea until 2008, 
We provided rice as a form of loan, but from 2009, the Li Myung-wai administration, that project has stopped. But anyhow, this rice in South Korea, we had too much rice produced, which led to lower prices. So in 2010, because of a problem, uh, we began to provide rice again because of the natural disaster, the flooding that happened in North Korea. And that was the last time that we provided assistance uh, on rice in North Korea. So again, if you look at these examples, you will see that this is a mutually beneficial project for both South Korea and um, North Korea. And there was also the unification strawberry project in which there was strawberry cultivation technology transfer to the north. So in North Korea, the uh, strawberry seed seedlings had been grown, the saplings it was grown in North Korea, and that was brought to Tangjin in uh, South Korea and eventually cultivated. And in Southeast Asia, we were also running farms. And so we could provide assist. Uh, we could ex have collaboration which included North Korea, South Korea, and the different Southeast Asian countries as well. So in if we were to try to try to find solutions to how we can encourage North Korea to continue to participate in projects with us, I think we have to focus on areas that's going to be of mutual benefit to both countries. Another thing I want to mention is that there are things that are left. We have a lot of surpluses in Korea, for example, our uh, manure and fertilizers. Uh, a lot of the livestock byproducts also, if you look at the factories in South Korea right now that uses livestock byproducts to make fertilizers, they have an over uh, supply of these raw materials. And so we can think about ways to provide that raw material to North Korea. Dr. Kim, in the interest of time, please make your conclusion. If you look at the, if you visit the fertilizer factories, there is a lot of uh, raw material that has been uh, accumulated in these factories. But these raw materials will be very helpful to North Korea also. So we need to continue to identify such projects, such areas where we could have mutually beneficial uh, results for both Koreas. Thank you very much. So having that win-win relationship established between the Koreas would be very important. In fact, we have a question related to that the attitude of North Korea, the fact that it's resisting any monitoring activities with regards to aid. So I think that kind of an approach to the projects, collaboration projects, will be very helpful in easing those concerns. Thank you. Well, we've heard from our discussants as well as speakers. And I think that the Pyeongchang Peace Forum has an excellent system in place. So we have about 20 questions for our session. We cannot answer all of the questions, unfortunately. Uh, but if you do log on to the website, uh, you will be able to uh, skim through all of the questions. And I think that you cannot answer all questions, but maybe Dr. Kwan, you do have a couple of questions. But before that, I believe that uh, there was this excellent comment. It said that uh, this is an excellent uh, session and that it was on a uh, important topic and the participant was very happy about the presentation of the sessions. I'm very happy we have this comment here and I hope that we have more excellent presentations to contribute to the Peace Forum. So with regard to Dr. Kwan, there are a couple of questions. How can North Korea resolve its food insecurity problem? And secondly, South Korea also is experiencing some problems with regards to food distribution or food supply. So how can we resolve that? So please answer that question later on. So North Korea's food self-sufficiency rate as well as South Korea's food self-sufficiency rate being low, how can, resolve, how can we resolve these issues? Uh, the sec 
Uh, the next question is for Professor Ha. Are there any actual examples of cooperation uh, to identify uh, optimal cultivars? And what is uh, North Korea's attitude in terms of this collaboration in R&D in the agricultural space? Question for Dr. G is, is it possible to resolve the food shortage problem in North Korea? Short term wise, it may be very difficult. So do you think it's possible anyhow? And because of South Korea's climate change problem, uh, we are experiencing a lot of agricultural field problems. So what are we to do with that? Another question is on the food surplus in advanced countries. Could we find a global or establish a global system to transfer that surplus to the developing countries? So if you are able to answer that question, please answer that as well. So first of all, Dr. Kwon. I will try to address the question uh, from our audience as well as the comments from our panelists. Dr. Kim Sung Nam, you mentioned that, of course, planned economy would still be important in North Korea, but it will not give up market introduction of market principles also. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, it will. North Korea will have to expand the market elements eventually. However, if you look at the current situation, it's very difficult. So short term wise, North Korea will continue to emphasize planned economy or the role of the state more. So in fact, I did have a chance to participate in monitoring activities in the food rationing centers in North Korea previously. And we needed to monitor whether the rice that we provided was actually going to the North Korean people. And in fact, that was very, uh, of course, that monitoring activity was conducted for formality's sake, but I still, import, uh, I still feel that monitoring activities would be very, very important in the future, uh, particularly with regards to UN aid. Monitoring would still be an important element. With regards to food self-sufficiency in South Korea, we have about 50% for livestock. We all have food, uh, food self-sufficiency rate of only about 25%. And of course, we it'll be impossible, almost impossible for us to reach 100% self-sufficiency with regards to food. The same for North Korea. North Korea would be overall at about 80% sufficiency rate, and it has a food rationing system, and it's controlling food consumption. That's why it has a relatively higher sufficiency rate. But North Korea has about half the population of South Korea. And so in the future, so the food need of North Korea will not remain at about uh, 5 million tons, but it may go up to about 9 million tons. So, and that will mean that its food sufficiency, self-sufficiency level will be lower to about 50%. And so that is why technology and other cooperation with South Korea will be necessary in order to increase productivity in the North. Our South Korean government's um, unification policy is not political unification policy, but uh, economy or cooperation-based unification policies. And so we really need to find a way to help North Korea increase its productivity. And of course, North Korea should not just insist on self-sufficiency. It needs to ensure that it can find sustainable ways uh, for uh, in the field of food. And so on areas where they can be self-sufficient, go ahead. But then there will certainly be other areas where it will need to rely on outside um, assistance. And about 96% of the uh, food item that North Korea uh, ex imported from outside was uh, flour. And so North Korea, rather than aiming for 100% self-sufficiency, should 
utilize different channels, different methods, to, and also focus more on increasing the income level of its people to ensure that they can secure the food that they need on their own. And of course, South Korea is already is carrying on such policies already. Next, Professor Ha, would you like to answer the question, please? Thank you very much for your interest. Uh, as we engage in this research, some mm, do criticize why we're ha we're, why we are engaging this study in the South, but thank you very much for your interest. And Ms. Kim So-young also had so many comments for my presentation. And she said that it's not just about food security. We're seeing this demand increasing for vegetables and fruit. And in order to respond, what we are try planning to do is right now we've been just focused on food crops in our research, but we also want to look into horticulture, fruit and vegetables. They lack protein uh, and vitamins, so we are also trying to expand the scope into vegetables, fruit, as well as livestock. So we're planning to launch such uh, research when the time comes, and this will include livestock manure and fertilizers as well. And we are going to connect pathogens with diversification. In other words, because of this diversification, we're seeing new pathogens arising. And the potato revolution has led to a blind introduction of uh, potato cultivars. And it did not go through quarantine. And according to several sources, uh, certain crops have pathogens that do not exist in the south. So I believe that it's important to focus more on quarantine efforts but this is, and survey, but this is not being done well. We've never uh, tried to introduce or study on a diversity of cultivars, but in Hungary and in Soviet countries, uh, we did see in the 70s and 80s where they went into the north to look into the diversity of cultivars as well as pathogens. And recently, uh, the professors went to the museum in Hungary to research the findings back then and also on the attitude of the north. Uh, you can see that uh, the scientists are, uh, uh, well, they really want to learn more. They're very happy and they welcome all of these research collaborations. But if we want to meet with the scientists, what would happen? There are also those that stand next to them, making it quite burdensome to have some candid contact with the scientists. But what I can say is when we do have our conversations with the scientists, uh, they, I'm probably sure it's the same case in the 70s and 80s. They really want to learn more. They're very willing. Uh, so collaboration and R&D is something that is necessary, and I think that it can be done very well. Thank you. The first question was on climate change in South Korea, uh, those experiencing food insecurity problems, so how can we resolve that? First of all, we do have Dr. Ha Sung-ki here with us. But the RDA is developing a lot of cultivars that are resistant to, to climate change. So I think that would be uh, one major uh, effort that we should continue. And in many different countries, including South Korea, the overseas agricultural projects are being developed. So f to strengthen domestic food security, we cannot focus just on the country. We need to expand our scope. We need to find ways for international collaboration. Of course, there are a lot of realistic, uh, uh, a lot of limitations realistically. So the dark horse right now is China's overseas expansion and increase in food consumption and thus increase in food imports, which is threatening uh, countries like South Korea, such as high, which have high um, external reliance on food. So we do need such external, and uh, anyhow, we do need such external uh, policies also. Another question was on an efficient distribution, surplus food distribution system globally. 
Yes, uh, that's uh, certainly a good suggestion. And in fact, from two years ago, the South Korean government also is, has been considering the WFP, World Food Program, uh, project to provide our surplus rice to other countries. However, well, the food security, uh, as the name it implies, this is a very sensitive area. So just because you have surplus rice or other crops doesn't mean that you can just provide it to other countries uh, readily because that may bring about some market distortions both within South Korea and in, in the global market as well. So it's actually easier said than done. Yes, thank you very much. I believe that this is being broadcasted live. That is why we do have to end on time. We have received more questions from our online audience. However, uh, I'm just hoping that our speakers and panelists will take time to look at those later on. So I think this was a very important session that we had on the food security of the Korean Peninsula and SDGs in North Korea. We've had a very meaningful and insightful presentations and panel discussions. And our speakers and panelists were really made a lot of contribution on what we should be doing in order to resolve the food problem in North Korea to help the country implement its SDGs. We really appreciate the fact that our speakers and panelists and our audience have been with us at this early morning hour. And with this, we'd like to conclude uh, the first parallel session of the Pyeongchang Peace Forum on food security on the Korean Peninsula and SDGs in North Korea. Thank you very much.